the so-called politics of the California prison system, which is the largest in the country, as California is the largest state in the country, are uh, really centered around two things, race and gangs. And there's a lot of YouTubers and other people talking about uh, prison stuff in and, and California, you know, is number one on the list. And I thought this would be, I thought it would be good to give a uh, kind of a more uh, accurate and general overview of the situation. So let's begin at the beginning and with black and white, Aryan Brotherhood and the black gorilla family. The guards at San Quentin have their own way of describing the mood of the inmates. They call it the climate on the inside. And this summer, the climate is hot. One white and two black prisoners have been killed. Fourteen inmates have been stabbed. And even moderate convict leaders concede the situation has sometimes become a race war. It used to be a certain group against another group. You know, the Nazis against the Muslims. But now it's a black face against a white face. And everyone is a target. Now, if you're a black man, uh, it don't make any difference what clique you belong to. As long as you're black, you're going to get hit. If you're a white man, it don't make any difference what your age or what clique you're going to get hit. And in the late 60s, of course, desegregation is going on around the country. And that desegregation came to San Quentin and California State Prison as well. And it caused a lot of violence. And by the late 60s, you had, along with the Mexican gangs that had formed, we'll talk about those in another uh, episode, you had the, the Aryan Brotherhood, which is ostensibly formed for the protection of white inmates, and the BGF, the Black Guerrilla Family, which um, at the very beginning, it was intertwined with the Black Panthers and had a Marxist-Leninist ideology. Uh, the BGF would protect certain white radicals that came into California prison system um, and its symbol is a, a dragon uh, I think attacking a, a prison gun tower so it was like an anti-government thing you know but some accuse the prison guards of stirring up the race trouble of sneaking in narcotics and weapons the police officers that work here bring their prejudice in from the street. The same guy that brings in dope that will bring in any other thing was the same guy that will bring in knives and supply it with other side and keep this stuff going. If you can live together, you live together, but when you got bulls telling you get this black when it gets down or another bull telling the blacks get this white when you get down, you can't stop nothing. I'm talking about guards. I'm talking about guards, yeah, bulls, yeah. But of course, as the years pass, society changes and the phenomenon that are going on evolve and those two groups have evolved and there's so many different stories to tell I'm just gonna give kind of a selected highlight reel to give a flavor of the situation well sooner or later and hopefully sooner the inmates will come to the realization that they've got to live together we have had the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazis and the black militants sitting down together and talking uh, we have done better than they have in civilization on the outside, I believe. So the Aryan Brotherhood is probably kind of the most frightening uh, set of people or prison gang people of all. Um, a lot of them seem to be just into violence for violence sake. I mean, it's, I mean, they can read quotes from many of them like that. And because they felt that the white inmates, there were less of them, they had to really set a mark of an intimidation through brutal murders. In the earlier years, a lot of those murders were of black inmates and et cetera, but uh, in all their RICO cases in recent years and all the murder charges against Aryan Brotherhood members, most of them, certainly not all, are against other white inmates. Of course, the nature of white inmates is a little different than black and Latino. It's a little, little harder to go to jail as a white man in the United States, so who, who are the white men in maximum security prisons in California, well, they're, they're, they're white inmates in general, in my experience, are a little more, um, it's a dichotomy. So you have a small amount of them that are like the most, some of the most hardcore, serious inmates, troubled people, or people have chosen to live a life of crime and do a lot of serious things. And then you got a lot of people like everyone else, drug addicts, kids from some suburb who, 
decided to break in some houses and they find themselves in an environment which they have no context for which to deal with. And, uh, you know, they seek out protection from people like Aryan Brotherhood or other prison gangs or people under their umbrella in California. But here's where things get interesting. 13 of the people being indicted are female corrections officers. You know, the ones running the jail. The guards allegedly helped leaders of the Black Gorilla family run their criminal enterprise in jail by smuggling cell phones, prescription pills, and other contraband in their underwear, shoes, and hair. Today you might know of the BGF, the Black Gorilla family, as uh, the California prison group allegedly or in the context of Baltimore and Maryland where they have a lot of power and it's unclear how those two groups are related and the Baltimore police says they're a street gang as well. There was a big indictment not too long ago or a few years back of a BGF leader in the Baltimore jail who I think he impregnated four different guards. Four of those corrections officers became pregnant by one inmate in particular, one of them with two of his kids, while he was serving time behind bars. Another two got the inmate's name actually tattooed on their bodies. They were flooding uh, the jail with drugs, uh, murders on the street, uh, the FBI surveilled uh, meetings in parks in Baltimore with the 100 BGF members, you know, street gang members, you know, to having outdoor meetings. It sounded like a scene from the Warriors. And uh, how they're connected to the original BGF, boy, that's pretty complicated and who knows what the truth is. <laughs> Now the BGF was formed uh, by George Jackson and a few others in the late 60s in San Quentin and it was very political. While in prison as a young guy, George Jackson was appointed uh, field marshal by the Oakland chapter of the Black Panther Party and was tasked with recruiting prisoners into the Black Panther Party. Communist ideology heavily informed the early BGF. I met Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, Ingalls, and Mao while in prison, George Jackson said, and they redeemed me. As a quick aside, there's also the issue of prison guards, and it's, it's always said that, uh, or I've heard it said many times, that like the white inmates, especially the Aryan Brotherhood, or, where, or even in the state of Michigan where I'm from, if you're in a place where there's a lot of white guards and not a lot of white inmates, it's said that the white guards will help the white inmates smuggle in weapons and other things, and one of the big Incidents in the late 60s at San Quentin is tied in with this. There was a day where something like 14 black inmates and two or three white inmates were put out on the exercise yard and started fighting, and a white prison guard shot and killed three of the black inmates. So then a couple days later, a white prison guard was thrown off a tier at San Quentin to his death and the people charged with the case, whose names were George Jackson, Fleeta Drumgo, and John Clachette. Uh, George Jackson, that's where he became, along with the others, known as the Soledad Brother. Soledad Brothers became, or Soledad Brother was a book that a lawyer, white female lawyer, helped him get published that became a big cause celeb and made him very famous. So George Jackson was uh, ready to get out of prison by any means necessary and his family was ready to get him out of prison by any means necessary. And, he, and let me set the scene of what's going on here in this 1969, 70, 70, 71. The National Guard is gunning down white students at Kent State. Black Panthers and other black militant groups are, are shooting white police and killing them in the streets and sometimes going to court and getting acquitted. Things like COINTELPRO, the Chicago Police Department, executing uh, the young leader of the Chicago Black Panther Party, which there's, there's a movie out about now. And uh, so it was a very violent atmosphere, people killing police, 
getting away with it, police killing people and getting away with it. And uh, so here we have at San Quentin, uh, this violence is now in this prison atmosphere and it's getting pretty intense. And George Jackson and his two cohorts that are uh, alleged to have thrown the white prison guard off the tier at San Quentin, they're charged with murder. And George Jackson had a 17-year-old brother on the outs named Jonathan. I think I would be the first to know if it's there was. I'm saying that there was no conspiracy that Jonathan, a 17-year-old man-child, was working according to the dictates of his own mind. Jonathan, with a gun registered to radical activist, uh, black female professor Angela Davis, the gun was registered to Angela Davis, he storms the Marin County Courthouse, Marin County, is uh, one of the richest counties in America now. It's up in the Bay Area. It's where San Quentin is. He storms the Marin County Courthouse. He grabs a judge, tries to kidnap him. He's going to try to force, I guess, them to release his brother in exchange for the judge. There's a shootout. Uh, he's killed. Uh, George Jackson's brother is killed. Uh, uh, then I think there's a guard killed. There's some prisoners that were in the courtroom killed. Crazy, crazy scene. So that's 1971. Fast forward to 1972. There's this ongoing race war between the BGF and, uh, it, well, it's not really between the BGF and Aaron Brotherhood. It's white people and black people in California prisons are killing each other. There's also stuff going on with the Hispanic inmates. So prior to uh, George Jackson's brother Jonathan being killed in the courthouse, attempted kidnapping and shootout, uh, uh, Jackson was already a celebrity from the publishing of his book, Soledad Brother, Letters from Prison. And this book had been kind of um, arranged and edited by his lawyer at the time, Faye Stender, a white female uh, lawyer. She had gotten the French philosopher who was really famous at the time, Jean Genet, to write a foreword. And this book sold hundreds of thousands of copies, so the funds went to his legal defense and uh, other um, people in custody. But Faye Stender then removed herself as his lawyer because she claimed George Jackson was pressuring her to bring a gun to prison in her, in her briefcase because lawyers aren't subject to the same sorts of, of getting checked as, uh, as other people. And I remember I was in jail somewhere and uh, a guy always was high on heroin and he was a sort of a celebrity and you know I found out his lawyer was bringing him heroin all of his legal visits so he could spend his whole time in the county jail because he had a bad case just high on heroin so lawyers do do that kind of stuff so Faye Stender removed herself from the case Stephen Bingham's the new lawyer Stephen Bingham one day in 1972 comes to see George Jackson and when Bingham leaves Jackson has a 32 caliber automatic uh, he and six other inmates uh, try to escape. There's some guards killed. Uh, George Jackson himself is killed. Stephen Bingham, the lawyer, goes on the run for about 13 years. He's eventually taken into custody. Or no, he turns himself in, I think, in California in the mid-80s, and he goes on trial and he's acquitted. And, and you might say, well, how is he acquitted? Well, the defense was that... Um, the guards, the white guards, actually gave George Jackson a gun so that he they would have an excuse to kill him. And the jury believed that, and Stephen Bingham was found not guilty, and he ended up becoming, uh, he got re-let onto the California bar, I think, not too long ago. And the Faye Stender saga does not end there either. Um, the unraveling of the Black Panther Party in the 70s and 80s, late 70s and 80s, a lot of dark episodes, one of which in about 1980, a BGF or Black Panther member broke into her home and, 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 and shot Faye Stender multiple times and she was paralyzed and, and after about a year of being paralyzed, she went to Hong Kong and killed herself. And the guy that shot her said that he did it because you know she, she had undermined the movement back in the early 70s. So pretty, pretty violent, dark situation all the way around. But prison is such a uh, 
unnatural environment that it, any weird thing that happens in there or any weird thing it does to anybody's brain in there really doesn't come as, as a shock to me. It, to have a bunch of men who don't know each other in close quarters with each other for years on end is so totally out of anything that our brains evolved to do. It's a wonder more and worse, weirder stuff doesn't happen and does. So there was a 16 a month trial of what was called the San Quentin Six. Those were the six inmates who, uh, along with George Jackson, who was killed, were part of the escape attempt. Several of them were totally acquitted. Now, one famous name you might know from the San Quentin Six, uh, Hugo Yogi Pinnell, uh, he became famous uh, as a, like a victim of human rights abuses in the U.S. prison system because he ended up spending 43 years in solitary confinement for his role in that. He was convicted of slitting the throat of two guards, though neither of them died. And so Yogi Pinnell was in uh, uh, solitary confinement from the early 70s all the way up until 2015 when he was let out and within a couple days of being let out, two Aryan Brotherhood associates who later in wiretaps was revealed earned their rock, their shamrock, they became made men for the Aryan Brotherhood, stabbed him to death on the prison yard, which then set off a riot between white and black inmates, I think at New Folsom Prison, or Sacramento Prison, it's, I think inmates call it New Folsom, it's technically Sacramento Prison, I think. After 70 inmates rioted this afternoon, Betty Yu shows us when the dust settled, one of California's most notorious prisoners was dead. His friends called him Yogi Bear, a name that hardly suggests the convicted rapist he was, or the convict who was part of the San Quentin Six. Now, back to the Aryan Brotherhood. So, a guy named uh, Ronnie Yandel, who's at the center of a 2020 California Aryan Brotherhood RICO case, where they indicted a bunch of Aryan Brotherhoods that were already in the California prison system for running a big criminal empire with smuggled cell phones. Ronnie Andell was uh, on a wiretap telling, I think a guy named Pat Brady in the AB that yeah, he, he ordered the hit on, or sanctioned, he and others sanctioned the hit on Yogi Pinnell because he was known for uh, saying derogatory things about white inmates and uh, and, and Yandel is charged with that murder as part of his RICO charges. But now let's, let's, here's where, you know, it starts getting even more complicated. Back in 2013, there was a big hunger strike. And there was inmates housed in the Pelican Bay Shoe on, in an area called the Short Corridor. So it's known as the Short Corridor Hunger Strikes. And representatives of, of all four of the main California prison gangs, the BGF, the AB, Western Familia, and the La MA, Mexican Mafia, um, orchestrated at least for a few days, 30,000 inmates in California prisons didn't take their meals. And then of course, as time passed, it became fewer and fewer, but this group of hardcore guys in Pelican Bay and other shoes, Folsom Shoe, Shoe is security housing unit, that's where all the the validated gang members, the ABs, the BGF, had been slammed down forever. So the California Department of Corrections had a, had a thing of, if you were a validated gang member, you go basically to the hole forever. I mean, living years together uh, with these other validated uh, members of different races, and we come to find out we have a lot of things in common. And that, you know, we have similar upbringings and similar, we went through similar things and, and, and understood why we, we about the way we did and a lot of it was that we were manipulated that uh by older people that you know that you uh look up you looked up to for one reason or another and um so the hunger strike was all the different uh gangs and racial groups coming together to say well that's a human rights violation you can't put a guy in a hole for 20 years and they barely have any human contact. So Ronnie Yandel was one of the leaders of this on the white side, the Aryan Brotherhood side, and it resulted in, um, well, there was an Aryan Brotherhood named Todd Asker who wrote a federal um, complaint that actually won, 
and and they had they had to end it. And so a lot of these guys, the gang leaders, got put back out into some form of the general population, or at least a little more access. And uh, I mean, they didn't go to low security or anything, but they weren't now slammed totally down where the only other people they were interacting with were the other gang leaders like in Pelican Bay every cell is you know serious people from each of the groups and Ronnie Andell then ended up getting indicted in 2020 along with others for uh, reasserting the Aryan Brotherhood's dominance over the white uh, population in the California prisons, they were they had a big meth ring. It generated a lot of money. I was just listening to a story on a great YouTube channel called Stories by a Current Prisoner. And there's a guy named uh, Powder. I think he was in Public Enemy Number 1, Peni, a white street gang that became a prison gang that did the Aryan Brotherhood's bidding. And he was talking about being at a prison where an Aryan Brotherhood named Travis Burhop, who's part of this indictment for these exact charges, was had some Hispanic workers that that like were um, they weren't guards but they like worked in the kitchen and Travis Burhop's mother had married a Mexican someone with the cartel connections and he was giving kilos of Mexican mud heroin to these uh, Hispanic kitchen workers and they were bringing it in for the Aryan Brotherhood so there were kilos and of, of, of heroin and pounds and pounds of meth being brought into this one prison. Huge drug ring, and it's part of the indictment as well. And uh, uh, Yandel and others ordered a bunch of murders uh, of, other, of whites and attacks on whites uh, that were in, there were four white prison gangs, the USAS, United Society of Aryan Skins or something, Golden State Skins, the Wolf Pack, and maybe something else that were trying to usurp the authority of the Aryan Brotherhood and the Nazi lowriders and, um, and, and public enemy number one who was kind of handling the Aryan Brotherhood's business on the main lines. So go check out stories from a current prisoner. Lots of current prisoners calling in. They seem to be mostly from the quote-unquote special needs yards because they're gang dropouts, but they're the people that would know. A lot of them are doing all day or close to all day, uh, Hispanic, white, black, and they're telling you the inside scoop, at least from their perspective. And always remember with criminal things, there might not really be a truth because everyone has to withhold things or make themselves sound a certain way, but in society, you have drama, you have politics, you have uh, uh, crime, you have uh, uh, across the board. The prison system is a microcosm of that. But you have the difference is, is you have a bunch of convicted felons, right, who mo a majority of which are come from the working class poor communities had a hard life, um, probably involved in drugs. Now, the BGF and the uh, Aryan Brotherhood were born in California prisons, but there, there's federal branches of them as well, and, and there's also branches in different states. But the federal branches are separate, but connected. Some of the same people that were there when those groups were started in California are now in the federal um, versions of them and uh, so we just we just talked about how the AB and the BGF and other groups combined in this hunger strike uh, to get themselves out of the shoe and in the AB indictment the federal government alleges that the the hunger strike was kind of a sham and these guys would be snuck meals and it was just a way for the leaders of all the prison gangs to get back onto the main line I don't believe that. I mean, you know, it is legitimately human rights abuse to be put in, uh, in isolation for that long. But, you know, people's motivations are complicated. And apparently when some of them got out, they did get back busy with criminal activities. But their RICO case is still ongoing. So it's all alleged at this point against the AB as far as these new charges. Now, 
On the federal side, back in 06, there was a massive, I think it was the biggest, oh, they always say everything's the biggest, but this, it was like one of the, it was the biggest death penalty RICO case ever in U.S. history, and it was against a federal Aryan Brotherhood, primarily in, in, led by uh, Tyler Super Honky Bingham, who could bench press 500 pounds at the age of 60, and bury the Baron Mills, the half-Jewish uh, Aryan Brotherhood federal co-leader, and um, uh, one of the two of the murder charges in that case were of two black guys from Washington, D.C., who they refer to as the D.C. Blacks in Lewisburg Federal Prison, and James Doc Holliday, who's a BG, federal BGF high up, he actually got on the witness stand on behalf of the Aryan Brotherhood to, to state that at Lewisburg there were only 10 or less Aryan Brotherhoods and that they were so outnumbered by the D.C. Blacks, who there's, D.C. Blacks are black inmates from D.C., which has, it's not a state, so there's no state prison. So they're the single largest kind of geographic and ethnic group in the federal prison system, and lots of people have bad things to say about them, but that's probably just because they're the, they're often the dominant group in any prison because there's so many of them, and so that, the BGF and the DC Blacks apparently don't get along in, in the federal prison system, and Doc Holliday testified that if the Aryan Brotherhood did kill some DC blacks it would have only been in defense and that the Aryan Brotherhood tried to defuse, tried to defuse uh, racial problems in Lewisburg because they knew the serious repercussions of any sort of race war. So, so, so you have a BGF guy kind of acting as almost like a character witness for Aryan Brotherhood in this case back then. But now Doc Holliday is a guy who when he was in California State Prison he, what did I, I think he got stabbed by the Aryan Brotherhood and he stabbed out the eye of some other Aryan Brotherhood. So, you know, he, he was no friend to the Aryan Brotherhood, but, you know, it's pretty complicated in there. And um, Doc Holliday uh, hails, well, I don't know if he's from there, but his cases were out of Pacoima and Pacoima if you ever wonder where uh, rap manager Wack 100, who's a Piru, well, he's a Pacoima Park Piru, I think. And Pacoima's this little enclave of black population that's been a black area since, I think, the 40s, way, way out in the valley at the edge, northern edge of Los Angeles. And Doc Holliday's and some of the BGF street cases uh, for drugs and murder from the 70s and 80s were out of. Pacoima, including a quadruple homicide, and one of the cases, uh, Doc Holliday. Doc Holliday was in this big case with the guy Ray Ray Browning in the late 80s, and Ray Ray Browning had been charged in the late 70s with killing two people in Pacoima on behalf of Doc Holliday, but then the witness statement was thrown out because the witness only said he saw Doc Holliday after he'd been hypnotized by the state's psychiatrist. So I was, pretty bizarre stuff. And Doc Holliday's been in prison along with Ray Ray Browning since the late 80s uh, for this big drug case. Uh, uh, big James, who I interviewed, my friend Jay Joker's cousin, uh, was in the Ray Ray Browning case. He mentions it. Bro, he doesn't really talk about the case. He just said he was one of the people indicted. And he did 20-some years on that case. You can check out uh, some of his interviews. I'll put the links below. Um, so right now there's an ongoing RICO case against California Aryan Brotherhood. Um, I, the BGF mm, kind of keeps a lower profile, it seems like. I don't know how active or what's going on with them. Um, but maybe I'll be able to get somebody to shed some light on that soon. But both of these groups, I mean, this have a long, big, big history, in some ways parallel what's going on out in society. Maybe in the past they did. Now it's pretty, it's like prison. So many people in America have been to prison and are in prison that it's like its own world, but that world is now spilling out into the regular world. And 
and it maybe kind of happened in California first where you had, you know, because I, when I was in jail in Arizona, I, I just the whole racial division and all that, it's just so artificial. And then I realized that, well, it's useful to the prison administration because, of course, if inmates are fighting each other, they can't go after the administration. And if you think back to the birth of the AB and the BGF, late 60s, tremendous, not so much unrest between racial groups in America, the unrest was towards the elites, right? Remember, it was the white youth and the black youth, the Black Panther parties. Mantra was all power to all the people. White power, black power, et cetera. It wasn't just black power, uh, but then if you turn it into a race war, well, there's a race war between the non-elite whites and the non-whites, and meanwhile, the elites are now spared from everybody else going after them, and uh, you know, the, 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 the Mexican mafia totally change the landscape of Hispanic gangs in Southern California, and we'll go into that in another, another chapter. But the AB and the BGF, um, we'll see if you guys want me to go into more depth on this stuff, and if so, I'll get some people that can talk about it. Our Prophet, American Dope.